welcome you all now and we're the order of events today is we're going to do a little open mic in, and then we're going to segue from that into our speakers who are also going to read and then we'll go into the conversation so welcome to everyone and thank you for being here tonight my name is Katie Porter and I am executive director of Inlandia Institute we are a literary 501c3 nonprofit based in the Inland Empire and we are here tonight as part of the Riverside Arts Walk. We are a proud partner of the Riverside Public Library who so generously offers us the space and we have with us tonight Charmaine Mendez. Woo! Hi Charmaine. Um, so if you don't have a library card or if you want to just come check out some books, literally or figuratively, we have some books on the table for you. So please uh, say hi to Charmaine. I also want to give a shout out to the friends of the Riverside Public Library and also to the city of Riverside and the California Arts Council who all provide uh, funding and support for these events. <coughs> So tonight we have with us Ricky Rodriguez, Richard T. Rodriguez. Do you prefer Richard or Ricky? Ricky. All right, sorry. We, I know him as Ricky, so welcome, Ricky. And Juanita Mance. Who many of you know as Jam. So uh, Ricky is an English professor at the University of California, Riverside, and the author of this brand new book, A Kiss Across the Ocean, which we have here tonight for $10 um, at the back table. Yeah, just that book right there. Um, and we have Juanita Mance, who is a deputy public defender and also a podcast host. And she is a punk rock lawyer and the author of Portrait of a Deputy Public Defender, or How I Became a Punk Rock Lawyer, and Tales of an Inland Empire Girl. So before we officially begin, uh, I do want to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Kawea, Tongva, the Wasenyo, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Atlantia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to work and live on these homelands. So um, before we launch into our discussion, we're going to start with a few open mic readers are to, to kick us off, I'd like to bring up one of Inlandia's authors, the author and uh, prize winner of the Hillary Graven Dyke Prize, Adam et al. Come on up, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, how many are we reading for the open mic? One, two? I'd say one. Okay. In that case, since we are representing Inlandia, I will read from the 2019 Euro Rare Prize regional winner, Freeman, of course, my official. Uh, this is the first poem in the collection called Build. Walk into the river until you can't touch the bottom without baptism. Rocks in your pocket will hold you down. The past is a wilderness of horrors. Build a house for the dead to live in. Count crow's feet out of the corner of your eye. Souls meet at high tide where waves crash on cliff sides. Low tide invites you. Come inside. In the ocean, life and death converge and all we love we leave behind. In the jungle of my mind, I penetrate providence with the passion of a lover hiking out wild vines, creating thousands of cuts so clean I never feel a thing. I believe language. I see double in the junkyard of my mind, jumble lies and lies, lie and rubble, make sense of the wreckage, colonize you, self-appropriation, tear trees from roots and children from the womb, man eating fellow man descending into barbarism. It begins at home. Repression keeps us safe, 
but there to shake the foundation. Peel that second layer, floating spit, hovering, holding my mood in with every word I choose not to say. Moments of sheer panic, aching for who we were, like missing your gallbladder when it's removed. It's beautiful organ donor weather. My death is your holiday. I left my body for you. Ask the paramedics for my driver's license. Scrape me off of this newly constructed highway. Sun, shine on this synambulance. The self is split. Destroy and rebuild, destroy and rebuild, destroy and rebuild. Thank you, Adam. So uh, I'm actually second on the list. So I'm going to read you a poem. How many of, oh, no, I'm going to read you this other one. Okay. How many of you have seen the wild burrows around here? Yeah? Okay. So I love the wild burrows. So this is um, a poem for them. Wild burrows. My sneakers crunch gravel by the side of the road. I leapt from my car, from my wilderness green outback. It's all wheel drive overkill for city folk like me. Wild burrows own this hillside. Ordinarily they graze unseen, their plain coats twinning with the stone of outcroppings. But now they glow electric against the emerald of a post-winter wet weather landscape. I click my tongue. One looks directly at me. They munch, nothing for company but themselves, the twittering birds, and the increasingly frequent cars. Sometimes they parade through the city as though they own the road, litter it with leavings like ticker tape. They do not sense danger when they stray into our territory. Mammal to mammal, I want to warn them. My husband silences the engine. We are just yards away, yet the burrows don't move. To live so tenderly in the moment, to live as though nothing in this world could ever cause harm. Thank you. And now on to Heather Takanaga. Heather, come on up. ultimate mother. She's also a cushion. She's a looker. She's a brand maker. She's a lover. Until the baby has explosive diarrhea. Then Earth is a giver to father or partner or brother or uncle or cousin or friend or neighbor. Her beloved community of man who pick every side of her, who claim every curve of her until usually clean up that, and they usually clean up after themselves. They better anyway. Because Earth is also a love so vast and mighty, men know to never piss her off. There is no replacement for their altar, their queen, if anything happens to the baby. Earth forgives, she heals, she never forgets. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was great. So now we have Janet Alexander. Come on up, Janet. Okay, this is from a collection of bilingual children's poems that I'm working on for a book. And it's called Marigolds uh, in Spanish, Sempasuchiles. I'm going to read the Spanish first and then I'll read the English. Sempasuchiles, anaranjados y amarillas. Sus pétalos como recitos estallan de alegría. Su olor oscuro y estaciado se mezcla con los olores de las frutas y las velas. Ofrendas en el altar. Zampasuches brillantes, pequeños soles de fuego, que alumbran el camino para que los ancestros regresen. And in English, marigolds, orange and yellow, their ruffled petals burst with joy. 
Their dark, spicy smell mingles with the scents of fruit and candles, offerings on the altar. Glowing marigolds, small fiery suns that light the way for ancestors to return. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was beautiful. So now we're going to segue over to our speakers. I'd like to bring up Jen. Come on up. Big girl, big podium. Okay. Uh, this story is from a portrait of a deputy public defender and how I became a punk rock lawyer, which was my first book. And this story is called A Metamorphosis. And I quote Frank, Franz Kafka, The Metamorphosis. I cannot make you understand. I cannot make anyone understand what is happening inside me. I cannot even explain it to myself. In my sophomore year of high school, my metamorphosis began. I gave up being a goody-goody and ditched the swim team along the school most days and dyed my hair blue-black. Soon after, I pierced my nose, which was shocking to many in my high school back in the 1980s. I began wearing all black outfits, black eyeliner, mimicking the eyes of Susie Sue, my favorite singer from the band Susie and the Banshees. By junior year, the change was complete. The new style got me attention. I would walk the quad with my best friends, Tracy and Melinda, all decked out in black. And sometimes we could hear whispers, go on a spell. With eager hand-wringing curiosity, we bought a book on Wicca and pledged to only do white magic. But in truth, the only magic we did was reading our fortunes with tarot cards and poring over horoscopes at the Crystal Cave in Claremont. We were a three-member coven, one without any spells, potions, or powers. In truth, I was more of a poser Catholic Mexican witch, a bruja who was more style than substance, one who was really into the dark wave music by bands like The Cure, Joy Division, The Smiths, Sisters of Mercy, along with punk bands like The Sex Pistols, The Clash, Generation X, Their Moats, The Buzzcocks, and my favorite Los Angeles punk band, X. My Mexican mom was horrified by my change in style. She would say disdainfully, you look like a bruja, a witch. So ridiculous. Why do you dress like that? My tears would say, Que fea, that's so ugly. Mija, take off those contact boots. My white cowboy dad was more gentle, and he would say, Jenny, don't dye your hair so dark. It's much prettier brown. What no one understood, however, that my change from goody two shoes to goth like punk princess was not about my outside. It was about my inside. It was about my interior, not my exterior. The change I made. I recognized, even way back then, that although I was not never educated about it until years later, that I had a melancholy sensibility. Adding a punk rock recipe for anarchy and fucking the system, and my change to punk rock girl was predestined in my soul. When I found the art, namely punk and dark wave music, it touched off a creative spark waiting to be lit in me. There was no going back. Homecoming, in my mom's opinion, was a disaster from the pictures. My mom did not appreciate my Bates mohawk or my shiny, iridescent black dress with lace sleeves that would make any goth girl swoon. She hated my blue-black hair curled in wigs and my stud earring in my nostril and my makeup. Black eyeliner lines so thick on the upper lid that it would take days to come off. And bright red lipstick and a cupid bow. My mom wailed, oh, how can I show these pictures to your tias? Instead of bowing my head, I should have looked her in the eye and said, I am and will always remain inside and out a punk rock girl. Thank you.
And you still are. <laughs> Haven't changed much. All right. So, Ricky, come on up and let's get a taste of your work. Thanks, Katie. One of the most memorable and undoubtedly useful classes I took in high school was typewriting, providing me with an advantageous ability to move fairly quickly on the keyboard for the lifelong purpose of writing, along with an attendant praise garnered from witnessing friends who missed out on the chance of enrolling in such a class. This ninth grade elective additionally helped facilitate the introduction to one of my all-time favorite bands, Bauhaus. It was, one, it was one particular person also taking Mrs. Smart's typewriting class, a peer, an upperclassman, and at least in my eyes, an on-campus celebrity, who brought the post-punk band from England into a room filled with antiquated middle typewriters, as well as into my record collection. Sean was railed in with short black and spiky hair. He wore tight-fitting black jeans tapered at the ankles and traded daily between midnight blue velvet creepers and black Oxford Doc Martens. His self-assured posture and carefree attitude also contrasted with my painful, insecure, and inhibited character. Sean also regularly sported t-shirts announcing his favorite bands. One of his favorite shirts, evidently so given that he wore it at least twice or sometimes three times a week, was white with black lowercase letters spelling out Bauhaus. Beneath the lettering was a thin figure correspondingly in black, vampire-like, or in black, Vampire-like, this figure held a woman who was either dead or unconscious and closely matched Sean's adopted look. It also reminded me of the friends with whom he kept company at lunch and whom I admired from afar. This figure, I would later learn, was that of Bauhaus's lead singer, Peter Murphy, who would identify this as his mirror image. The Death Rockers, as they were known at the time, goth was not as commonly used as a descriptor then, at least by those outside their social sphere were a group of teenage kids of various, various ethnicities and races. Yet the pale-skinned ones were more capable of crystallizing a seemingly mandated power aesthetic. Sean, however, diverged from the rest. While the light-skinned Latinos and Latinas could lighten up with a layer of white face powder, Sean was distinctly, as I soon discovered, unapologetically brown. Indeed, he spoke Spanish, had no qualms with cultivating friendships beyond the death rocker cloud crowd and often mentioned his Mexicanness to me in, in an overheard conversations. And if turning white was even a possibility, I recall how he'd oftentimes roll up the short sleeves of his Bauhaus shirt, a move which I read as the need to avoid the dreaded farmer's tan. I don't remember how he entered into my orbit to the point where we began talking. Was the introduction facilitated through a mutual friend? Did he finally respond to my incessant and probably obvious staring? In any case, Sean eventually gave me the name Smiley, and we would chat from time to time during class, after school, and even once at the South Coast Plaza when I was shopping with my mom. Although my familiarity with Bauhaus increased after reading about them in the pages of the Japan, of the Japan fanzine to which I subscribed, uh, due to Murphy's post Bauhaus collaboration with former Japan bassist Nick Karn under the name Alex Karn, it was the adornment of the t shirt with its stunning image lifted from Robert Wine's 1920 German silent horror film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, on Sean's brown Mexican body that prompted my entry into Bauhaus's sound world. Indeed, the affectionate rapport I established with Sean, hey, smiley, helped facilitate Bauhaus's profound impression on me. Not unlike the image on the t-shirt, the band and its music potently fused sexy and sleek with sinister defiance. Whether it was the emboldened double dare dare you to be proud, dare to shout aloud, or convictions that you feel, like sound from bells to peel, or the melancholic all we ever wanted was everything, flash of youth, shoot out of darkness. Bauhaus's music stirred a range of emotions and materialized as an arsenal of auditory weaponry for navigating the rooted working class and racialized terrain of a Mexican majority of the city, 40 miles southeast of Los Angeles. And comparable to the sway of this band from Northampton, a city 70 miles northwest of London would have over two Mexican-American kids like us, members of Bauhaus, including singer Murphy, bassist David J, guitarist Darren Lash, and drummer Kevin Hoskins, would likewise derive influence from Latinos and Latinas during their statewide visits and eventual Southern California relocation. 
And so I'll just briefly say that each one of these chapters opens with a personal anecdote. And I talk about a, a band from England, a post-punk band, that had a significant impact on me. And so I tie in personal anecdotes and try to provide a cultural history that relates the interrelationships between Latinos in, in, in Southern California, but in the United States in general, and then these musicians from Britain. But thank you very much. Ricky, that was great. And I can definitely see, you know, we're calling this talk music and memoir. And those anecdotes are very much memoir. Um, so I guess my, my first question for you guys is, what, uh, well, can you tell me the origin story of your book? When did you know you wanted to write this book about the music and and how did that how did your memoir fit into that? Were you able to? You know, we're also wanting to talk about um, how did you publish this book, start to finish. So I guess how did you sell that to a publisher? Yeah, either one. Of okay. Them. All right. So um, I I don't want to go on too much at length, but. I'm originally, well, I should say originally, but now kind of rediscovered my poet self. Um, when I was an undergrad, I took a bunch of poetry workshops, and I always wanted to you know, write poetry for a living. And my professor at the time, who was a mentor, told me, well, get a PhD instead, and you can write poetry, because there's a better chance of employment as a PhD. And so I listened to him. And, you know, it was somewhat good advice, but I felt like the poet side of myself just kind of disappeared um, as a result of having to write academic stuff. Um, this book actually wasn't supposed to exist. I was working on a second book, which was much more academic. But when the pandemic hit, um, I decided, you know, at the time I was taking care of my father, who was uh, who had just undergone some surgeries, um, that along with you know, the move to online teaching and all of this administrative work. But the one thing that could save me was writing, and writing things that I was really passionate about. And I had been invited to give a talk in Scotland um, about the band, uh, the Pet Shop Boys, and you know it turned into um, something that I hadn't realized that it was going to become. And so the project started to kind of take shape, and um, as a result of being in a writing group um, with a couple of colleagues, one in, uh, one including Michael Jaime, who's a creative writing professor at UCR, uh, we exchanged drafts, and one of the drafts um, was an early. Um, version of one of these chapters, and Michael saw in one of the footnotes a personal anecdote, and he told me, this needs to be in the body of the, the, the chapter. And I was terrified because it was like, I can't talk about myself. Um, but I listened to him, and in doing so, it just opened a floodgate of being able to relate um, you know, these stories about how this music had such a significant impact on me uh, as a teenager, and continues to do so uh, to this day. And so as I started writing the book, it was a matter of, of, of fusing this cultural history uh, with the memoir. And you know, it, and it turned out like this. And I have to say that one of the best things about that is that it's been able to touch people who are not academics, which I absolutely love. And in fact, it's received more attention outside of academia than inside. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and it just reminds me, you know, I always think of my mom who, you know, has a copy of this on her nightstand and she says, I really like the book, but I only read the stuff, well, I only read the parts about you. I don't really, you know, <laughs> don't really know what you're talking about, you know, the other stuff. It's interesting, but, you know, I like reading stories about you. And, and it, you know, I feel like it's not just about me because it's been, uh, people have been able to read this. And, and um, I did a re reading at uh, Romans a few months back where I saw Marcy. And people were coming up to me and saying, this is my story. And thank you for telling you know, your story because I feel like I connect to it and it, it's given me a license to talk about my own history with this music. And I think that's how Juanita and I met. Um, and you know, and I just have to say this real quickly, but um, I, in one of the chapters, I write about this music video program that was broadcast from Orange County if I'm not mistaken. And there was a young man who had entered a contest to meet Susie Sue, who Juanita just talked about. 
And so he appeared on the television show with his aunt, Myra. And I had this episode in my head for the longest time, and thankfully it was available on YouTube. Well, yesterday, uh, Juanita posted a picture uh, from um, that chapter with the image, and it turns out Myra is one of her best friends. And Myra actually is a friend that I went to college with, and she's sitting right here, right now. And so, <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it, there's a really cool you know, moment that I think highlights the way that the book has you know, a certain kind of resonance, not just with readers, but it's also you know, a community of people who are equally moved by this music, who are still you know, very passionate about it to this day. I'm getting kind of choked up because I heard Ricky read and I've read the book twice now and it captures um, his book, A Kiss Across the Ocean, it captures the intersection of Latinx culture and music in a way that I've never seen any book do. I'm a, a punk rock biography uh, addict. I've read, you know, Kill Me, Kill Me, I've read Chrissy Hunt. But this book, it, I mean, it talks about Adam Ant, it talks about Susie, it talks about Pet Shop Boys. And so I just have to say, I don't want to fangirl over you, but your book is amazing. You're a music aficionado. I mean, I, I like bow to you. So thank yeah. you for writing this. Yeah. You write it for all the punks and the Chicanos and the outsiders, and I really appreciate that. Um, so I started, you know, I had been working on Tales of an Inland Empire Girl, which has a lot of music in it, but no lyrics because we couldn't get the rights. Um, my publisher couldn't afford the rights. Um, and it has a lot of music in it. There's a story about Pasadena, where Jenny goes to Maryland's in Pasadena, and she's dancing to Cities of Dust. And then she goes home, and her mom beats the shit out of her. And it's based on an outsider story, so it's called Stay Gold. And it's really about not being gold, but about being black and blue. And, um, and about being a goth kind of girl. Like, we didn't call it goth back then, though, you're right. We called it death rocker. We called it uh, punk. Uh, I think the Chicanos that I hung out with, and of white people too, and black kids, that we hung out at Chafee High School in the Quad, we didn't know the difference between punk and post punk. Susie to us was just as punk, and she is, as the Sex Pistols. And so, um, Portrait of a Deputy Public Defender, How I Became a Punk Rock Lawyer. This was magic. This happened during COVID. Um, I started writing these poems after George Floyd died about being a public defender and about the intersection with mass incarceration and punk rock. And so then I talked to Mark Gibbons at uh, Bamboo Dart and we just created this. And it's really a hybrid book. Um, and he came to me and we just, we just talked about what I wanted to do with music and memoir. And I really wanted to, I've always had a very insecure poetic voice. I've always been confident in my memoir voice. I love telling stories and I love telling my childhood stories and my teenage stories, but my poetic voice was something I was much more insecure about. So this cover, because I love the cover, it was designed by Dennis Calici, who owns Schirmfer Records, who's a punk label from the 90s. It's designed to look like a record. And it's a fusion uh, based on what I wanted of Ziggy Stardust, because Bowie's my idol, um, he's my god. and. Um, and X is under the big black sun. So I really wanted this book to kind of, um, I wanted to fuse memoir, poetry, and social justice essays. I have an essay where I talk about my obsession with Sid Vicious, and it's like, I'm a kid in the 80s, Sid Vicious is already dead, and I want to marry him for some reason. I mean, what is twisted about this girl? And so yeah, I really just wanted to show all the girls that I knew because girls like Myra, girls like me, we existed. And Alice Babb, I and mean, you talk about her in your book, and I didn't know who Alice Babb was when I was a kid. I know her now, I read her uh, memoir. But I mean, I really do think that we were kind of overlooked in Southern California in the punk scene. Everyone thinks about the English scene, and I wanted to be English, I'm an Anglophile, I'll be perfectly honest about that. I'm obsessed with The Damned and Bauhaus and all these English bands, and of course, Morrissey and the Smiths. But I really just wanted to show that um, there's something beautiful about the style of being a Chicana and being a punker. And you talk about it in your book, that style. It's almost a fusion, right? Yeah, so. Very, very cool. So, I guess I'm thinking a lot about something that um, a librarian said to me yesterday, and she read it somewhere else, but that the music that we listen to 
in our youth, like from teenage years through like age, you know, maybe mid twenties, that that's the music that sticks with you for the rest of your life. And I know um, it's really weird for me to turn on the oldies channel and find all of my high school music. And I don't listen to current music. And um, thinking about your relationships to this particular music style, I, I know everybody has different genres that they're attracted to, but why, why punk? Why um, the British punk scene? And why do you think that was so attractive to the Chicano, Chicanx community? Um, what, what's the connection? Um, you know, in Latin culture, if you look at Morrissey and his aesthetic, he has a very Latino aesthetic. His whole backup band right now is Mexican for the most part. Um, and I think that there's something about the crooning style that reminds a lot of people of Latin music. And I also think that, um, that there's the outsider aspect, and Ricky talks a lot about this in his book, the fact that we're outside, right, looking in. And the punk movement was really about poor white kids in England standing up and they had something to say. They may not have known how to play guitar perfectly or bass perfectly, but they had something to say. And for me, I actually think that my love for punk music, which I only realized this when I started writing my book, started with my dad's love of country. I grew up listening to Johnny Cash and Loretta Lynn and Freddie Fender was my mom's favorite. My parents were country. My mom would wear jean suits with fringe and she was a Latina and she loved white cowboys. And my dad had a Stetson and he was German and he had a big white dude. And so I think something about the storytelling in country and the intersection with bands like X and Social Distortion. And then something about Morrissey and Susie and the Cure and the darkness of that music when I was in high school and I was going through a lot, a lot of chaos. And my sister died, my parents lost their house. My dad tried to commit suicide. We were like going from rental to rental and all I would do is go to punk and post-punk shows to escape. And seeing Susie during her Peep Show tour was like, and seeing the Smiths live on stage in, I think it was 87. Those were the two best days of my life to this day. To this day, I have to say that I do not regret ditching school. And I, if I had to trade, <laughs> if I had to trade being a high school dropout with never seeing all the shows I saw, I would still be a high school dropout. Because I did okay, right? But I mean, I think that it was an escape, but it was also just it saved my life. I might not be here without the music, right? Morrissey, There's a Light That Never Goes Out. That song whispered in my head the whole day that I was, that my, I watched my twin sister graduate and I was hiding under the bleachers crying, just thinking of that Morrissey song in my head. And I kept on thinking, I'm gonna be okay. Like he gave me hope. And people may put down Morrissey, they may put down other singers, but you gotta judge them in their time, number one. But number two, you cannot discount the connection between Latinx culture and the punk and post-punk music. It's there. And it is overt. I mean, you just gotta look for it. And you just gotta go to a Morrissey concert. And I'm not even kidding. 95% of the people there are Chicano. Little kids, adults. And so, I mean, I just say, you know, I just, I just love the music. It's all about the music. You know, I think very similar to Juanita, you know, the, the music, you know, really saved me at a particular moment in time. And, you know, I opened the book by talking about you know, my, my, my dad leaving us once again, and um, my mom dropping us off at one of my aunt's house, our apartments, and, and it was that, it was a fortuitous moment. You know, we walked in the door, and there was a music video program, uh, and they were airing uh, Culture Club's mm -hmm. Karma Chameleon, and just seeing Boy George, you know, who I had heard about in high school, and you know, all the homophobic stuff that people were saying about Boy George, and, I just could identify because it was someone who was, you know, taking a stand and adamant about, you know, not conforming. And, and for me, that was just so empowering. And that was the first connection to this music that made me feel like I wasn't an outsider. You know, there was this identification with the music that, um, with, with the performers and then the music was just kind of this force field that got me through the, the difficulties of, of teenage life, or teenage, my teenage years. Um, so 
you know, the music still resonates with me to this day, but I think at that moment of discovery, it, it meant so much to me. It was also kind of what led me towards the path to what I do now, and as I talk about in the book, you know, it was the music, but then it was also the magazines and the newspapers that were uh, focusing on these artists and learning about the music that they were listening to and the, the artists that they were citing and, you know, the reflection of the politics that were, you know, taking place during that particular time. This is the 1980s, you know, Reagan and Thatcher, the, you know, the conservatism, but then also the various forms of resistance that were materializing at the time. It's kind of like what Juanita was saying, you know, it, this music is very politically charged and, and to be able to, you know, have that um, as, a, as another form of education where you learn about, you know, the world through the music and its performers, and then also, you know, kind of a life source for you. It just means everything. And, you know, and I'll just briefly say, you know, it, it, it is for a particular generation, but it's also music that continues to circulate for younger uh, generations of people. And in the conclusion, I talk about encountering this group of DJs at a concert in Anaheim, uh, the specials, and they had this banner and announcing their name, uh, which is Ghost Town, and it's a song taken from the specials, and it was about the economic disenfranchisement um, of, of, of Britain at the time, you know, the, the inability to find jobs, the, the increase of racism, the rise of the National Front, you know, and, 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 and really highlighting the cross-racial solidarities that existed in England at the time. And, and the way that these younger folks were translating that music for their particular generation, I thought was really inspiring and it really points to the way that this music continues to live on and have significance for people beyond you know our generation yeah it reminds me of that uh that has the, the song all i ever wanted was everything you know it's all about blue collar life and like working that menial job right yeah. Yeah. so thinking about that i mean music is very transporting. I think we can, everybody, you hear a song and bang, you're 17 again. Or, um, and thinking about also with stories and memoir, how you know that stories build empathy, they're how we identify and music is very much about, you know, it becomes a part of our identity. Um, so I guess I'm just thinking, you know, Juanita, most of your books are more story oriented. Um, Ricky, I know yours is more academic. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the academic part of the book? And maybe go, I want to try and segue into about the publishing part. So how did you find a publisher for this? Thanks, Kate. Yeah, you know, it, it, it is when you open the book, you know, if you look at the back, there are footnotes and, you know, bibliography, and it's undeniably an academic book, but it's an unconventional academic book in the sense that it does incorporate memoir uh, along with, you know, the history that I'm trying to tell and, and, and also cite other people who've written about these artists before. You know, I got really lucky because I had published my, my first book with Duke University Press, and when it comes to university presses, they're recognized as kind of going against the grain of traditional academic publications. They're more interested in publishing books that have um, you know, an impact beyond an academic audience. And as a result, a lot of academics kind of look down on them because it's like, oh yeah, you know, they're not really scholarly, you know, legitimately scholarly. scholarly. It's like, eh, I don't care. You know, and I think for me, you know, the, the work that I do as an academic, you know, I don't want to stay within the realm of academia. I want the ideas to extend beyond an academic audience. And so I was lucky to have the editor that I had for this book who was who wanted the experimentation, who wanted the fusion of, of an academic book with one that was you know grounded in memoir. And so, you know, I got really lucky to be able to publish with, with Duke um, because I think they're kind of you know, unconventional in the, in the academic publishing uh, sense. And you already, so you already had a relationship with them before the book was even a, a germ in your brain or? 
Yeah, so the first book was very academic, no memoir, no personal reflection, um, and I had a totally different editor. So this one is kind of known for taking risks and wanting to you know, publish books that were you know, unconventional. Um, so yeah, I like that. Okay. There is this thing, and that's I guess something else that, that your books have in common, is that they're really hybrid. Um, I don't know what genre, I mean I know yours is nonfiction, but it's also memoir, it's also um, scholarly, and Juanita's has a lot of, um, it has essays and poetry, and it's about being a public defender. So I know your publishing experience was, was quite a lot different. Yeah, you know, and I just wanted to say that I really see this as a uh, biography, like a rock biography to me. It's a punk rock, like up there with, you know, please kill me, kill me, and all these other, you know, John Linden's book and all these famous biographies about the punk scene and the post-punk scene. And I know it's academic, but I love it so much. I just think it's brilliant. I'm so glad they published it. Um, and it's amazing that an academic press would publish this, you know? And um, so anyways, but I think that this book, interestingly enough, Tales of an Inland Empire Girl, uh, I was went to Cinco Punto Press because they had published one of my favorite books by Isabel Quintero, who's from the IE, Gabby, A Girl in Pieces, which was a book I was obsessed with. And so I went to Cinco Punto and I pitched, I sent her my work and she wanted me to turn it, Lee Ballinger um, said I should turn it into a YA fiction novel. And I really didn't want to fictionalize it. I really wanted, I think that a lot of writers of color, we fictionalize because it's difficult. We don't want our parents to be stereotypes. We don't want to reinforce negative uh, stereotypes. And we're scared of what our families will say, right? Um, you're gonna write about your country alcoholic father and your Mexican country mother and, uh, and, and these three wild kids who steal cars and stuff like that and uh, Jenny the punk rock girl who drops out of high school. But I really, I always believed that young adult memoir existed. And I was told over and over again that the genre did not exist. But then I went to Vona for four times. I worked with um, David Murrah, I worked with Faith Adele, I worked with a bunch of writers that I really admired. And then I went to Macondo. I worked with Stephanie Alexander Greist, I worked with Joy Castro. And they gave me faith in my voice. And then I was doing a reading with one of my best friends, Liz Gonzalez, who wrote Dancing in the Santa Ana Winds. Hey Liz, shout out. And um, she's on the IE board with us now. And her publisher heard me read a story about my grandpa and about the cow farms in Norco. And he uh, said, I'd love to publish your work. And I had always heard that the magic publishing thing can happen. And it happened like that. And um, like I said, Portrait of a Deputy Public Defender, How I Became a Punk Rock Lawyer, this was just magic. This was meant to be, but for COVID, it would not exist. And but for Mark Gibbons and Dennis Kalichi of Bamboo Dart, they published a lot of local authors. They're little chat books that defy the genre. Um, and Dennis Kalichi is a punk rocker and a rocker, so he gets it. And um, Mark Gibbons is totally experimental, and they're both in Claremont and Upland. So they're IE people too, or IE adjacent. So I don't know, I would just say that if you're trying to publish your book, you have to believe in it. And if, because if you don't believe in it, no one else will. And this took 15 years. My dad died 17 years ago. I moved back to the IE from San Francisco. I gave up corporate law. I became a public defender and I started going to these writing workshops and then I wrote this book. And it took 15 years to get it published. And I mean, I, at one point, I didn't think it was going to happen. I'd given up. And then this happened, and this book came out first. So is that ironic or what? Like, I had to write about being a public defender in the intersection with punk rock and mass incarceration to find the authenticity and the, the confidence to publish the book really about me. So this is my baby, like Tales of an Inland Empire Girl, which is based on Judy Bloom's Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. Um, the title, I mean, it's influenced by Sandra Cisneros, Juno Diaz, who you quote in your book. Uh, you talk about his Susie-like character from his book, uh, Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. So it's influenced by so many people, and I just, I'm so glad it's in the world, so. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's in the world, too. And something that's really um, also becoming clear is a lot of what you're doing is about defiance, and that, and that seems to relate back to the punk aesthetic, punk rock aesthetic, and pushing back and pushing against 
boundaries. Um, so I guess um, <coughs> thinking about that, how long, Ricky, did it take you to write A Kiss Across the Ocean? It took you know 15 years to get Tales of an Empire to go out. And I so the the first chapter or the the seed for the first chapter for the book was that paper that I gave uh, at that conference that I mentioned earlier, and that was uh, 2016. And um, I turned in the manuscript in 2021, so about five years. Yeah. But uh, one of the things I wanted to say, if it's okay, you know, I was listening to Monica, and you know, and I and I think you're totally right, Katie. I mean, it, it is kind of a, a punk ethos in the sense that. You know, we not only wear multiple hats, but we're you know kind of defying you know, these genres and these expectations. You know that you can't be punk or a, a you know a lawyer, or you can't be a professor who writes about um, themselves because you're you're you know kind of going against the grain. And so I think I think that's the connection between and there are lots of different connections between our work, um, but I think you're totally you know, on point about that. Um, and I just love Juanita's work because it's, you know, it shows you that you can still have this defiant attitude while still at the same time doing this really important work. You know that's not just you know on the page, but also in everyday life that oftentimes goes unnoticed. And you know, I, I just think you know it, it's being able to you know, balance and or to juggle all of these responsibilities. Yeah, and on that same point, you know, I think um, I saw so many intersections. That's why there's so many pink caps. But there's a section here, I think, where someone tells you that you should listen to a Latin station. And I have a story in my book where people are taught, telling me I just need to listen to Power 106, Latin, which I love Latin freestyle. Don't get me don't get me wrong. I love some, some of that stuff. But I really do think that growing up, um, people try to pigeonhole you because you're brown or because you're half brown or whatever. And I think that it is punk rock to say I'm not going to be, you know, pigeonholed and I may like dance music, but I love punk music, right? And your book, I mean, um, I just have to, I have to show one of the pictures. You have, so what I loved about your book is you have all these pictures, like there's this one of Susie Sue, who's, you know, one of our idols, and, and there's one of Adam Ant, and, you know, the intersection with Adam Ant and mental health, you talk about that, you know, Adam Ant has been uh, psychiatrically hospitalized in some of the state hospitals that I represent clients in. And I just think it's really interesting that there's something about um, punk rock and mental health and mass incarceration and dehumanization. Um, in my courtroom, they used to call our clients bodies, bring up the bodies. And I, it's just so weird and dehumanizing. And punk talks about this a lot, you know? And then I would tell the deputy, don't use that. That's someone's kid, dude. Like, don't use the word bodies. And it's really difficult to tell your deputy that. They're there to protect you. I've had deputies save my life. So, but they listen and they, they learn. And I think that's what these books are about is like you're teaching people why this music matters. Because you don't know how much grief Latinos get for loving Morrissey. For loving Susie. Oh, she wore a Nazi. I mean, you talk about that and you talk about why you can't really judge these people by that. You know, you have to judge why we love the music and that matters to us. Anything? For sure. Um, so thinking about that, I'm, I'm curious if in the writing process, if you encountered any stumbling blocks or roadblocks to completing the book, like, or, or did it just all come out Boom, you're done. My day job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. No, it, 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 it took a while in the sense that sometimes there was information that I didn't have readily available. Um, and, you know, even I went to the British Library in London to um, try to find some, um, some materials there, and, and they weren't there. And oftentimes what I needed was on eBay. And so I took out a credit card and would have to, like, you know, I'm totally maxed out now, so I'm gradually paying it off because, you know, I had to buy, you know, these, these things that were, you know, not available in, in libraries, you know, the magazines, the, um, the newspapers, you know, things that weren't readily available. And so I amassed all this, you know, 
this material um, in the process of writing it. So, I mean, that was one of the, the hurdles in, in, in completing it. But once I was able to get that material, um, it it seemed to you know kind of flow. Um, so yeah. So the research you needed to have all of those materials at hand in order to finish the project. And yes. Yeah. Did Did I see somewhere that you're donating those materials? To oh, yeah. Yeah. So I spoke with. Um, uh, the uh, university archivist at UCR, and so I'm donating all of the magazines and newspapers and posters and buttons that I've acquired since I was a teenager. And so future researchers who are interested in writing about this um, the subject can oh, have access to the library. Very cool. So the next generation. Um, so I would like to open it up to some audience questions. Who in here? We've got. I know we've got a lot of writers in here. So. I'm curious about your families in the sense that it being pretty much what you guys have described. How would your life be if Juanita and your mom didn't see Wuhan? Because for me, like I said, in the same almost exact same night, I think my mom would have accepted me. I wouldn't be this. Because if she would have said, oh yeah, that's cool, whatever. You know, do your thing. I would have been like, okay, well, yeah, I gotta go to school, I gotta do all this thing, straight nine, whereas I was like, I'm a rebel, I'm not gonna do what you tell me. <laughs> and there's that Mexican in me that's like, I'm not gonna do what you tell me, I'm not gonna do what you want me to do. And the sad part is, if you have something I'm not sure about you, but like, how different are you from your siblings in the sense, same for me, like my mom controlled my siblings and they did what she told them, but she couldn't control me like ever. And so that's why I'm different from them. So I'm curious as to, you have some things in how some of you are to them, and obviously you know about your twin sister. What happened to the differences are between you guys? Jackie and Annie were disco biscuits, we used to call it. So my sister Annie was in a club called Girls of Aquanet, oh, and she know. had a black trench coat that had a, like a old English writing on the back. And my twin sister Jackie hung out with this girl named Felicia, who's punk and rockabilly now, but in high school, her and Jackie were Latin freestyle, then they were hip hop. So they were really like kind of into that other cultural thing, which there's a lot of intersection between punk and hip hop that I love. You know, Tupac and Bowie both have a song called Changes. And that's, it's, it's interesting when you think about the intersection with punk and hip hop and social justice. But you know, my twin sister used to tell, I would not be punk without my best friend, Tracy and Melinda. Like we were a coven, like we, Melinda was really into uh, heavy metal, but then she was also into punk. Tracy was into dark wave. So they both educated me because I didn't, I only knew like the stuff I grew up listening to, which was like country and, you know, um, 50s music my mom was into, Freddie Fender, Elvis, you know, Buddy Holly my dad was into because he was country. And, um, but I remember when I was in seventh grade and I saw this guy and you talk about Neuro in your book. So he looked kind of Neuro, Neuromantic, kind of had the hair like that, but he had a trench coat and on the back he had spray painted the Smiths. I was like, who the hell are the Smiths? What kind of name is that for a band? And then, you know, I, the, I think their first album, their self-titled album had just came out or something, seventh or eighth grade I was in. So, I mean, I don't, you know, I think I'm so lucky that I have my two best friends because they educated me on music and my best friend, Tracy, I don't listen to new music, but she gives me new music. She gives me throwback <coughs> bands to listen to. And so like, turn me on the strokes, the hives, like kind of throwback stuff. And I'm just so lucky because I, I found my tribe with them. And we hung out with punkers, Hessians, uh, they called them heavy metal heads. Um, we hung out with skinheads, we hung out with suicidals, we hung out with punkers. So I think in, at Chafee in Ontario, it was a very eclectic mix of punkers and post, like it was just a weird mix and they were all different colors, white, black, brown, Asian. We all hung out together and there were queer people, there were straight people. Like, I really think that that was like the outsider group. And back then, like having your nose pierced, I was the second girl in my high school to pierce my nose. It was a big deal. Like it was like frowned upon. Like, who are you? You're a freak kind of thing. But I wanted to be a freak. I love the freaks. Like you talk about Bauhaus and the cramps and uh, is it Kid Congo Powers you uh, spoke with from the cramps? I mean. I mean, that's like a dream come true to write a book and then get to speak with the dude from the cramps. I mean, you know? 
Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, you know what? I, I was just thinking about that, and you know, I've just been lucky. You know, I come from a, on my dad's side of the family, a family of musicians, um, and there, I could play an instrument to save my life. And so, you know, kind of now that I'm middle aged, I became a DJ, and so I have a show on KUCR uh, on campus. Um, but my parents have always been uh, supportive of the music that I like, even though they may not like it. You know, they have always encouraged it because I think they kind of see, you know, where it's led me. And you know, I I, I think there's so much to say that. Um, um, that I don't want to open up a can of worms and start crying here in front of you, but um, but I just think that you know th there was this realization early on that my gravitation to music was something that was um, that's something that they could support, and even though they may not have agreed with what I listened to or liked it, they never discouraged it, um, and. Now to this day, you know, when this book is out, both of my parents are like, wow, I can't believe, you know, people are actually reading your book. And they don't say it in a bad, <laughs> in a bad way, but they, I think they thought it was like, you know, oh, it's only you who, li who listens to this crazy music. But, um, but yeah, they now see that it's not just me. <laughs> All right, any uh, other audience questions? Raise your hand. Yeah? James, okay. Hi, um, Mother, thank you very much. It was really great to listen to you. Um, my question is this, if I followed you around in your daily life, besides writing music, what would be the puffiest thing you do? Uh, yeah, you go for it. I ride the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't drive, I use public transportation. And I think that's very punk. Um, Good for you. Kiss me on the bus, by the way, please. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, Sleeper Mods is one of my favorite bands right now. They are a newer band, and they have this whole uh, video of them on the bus. And I think it's a very a punk and blue collar. I think if, if you you have to recognize the class issue mm -hmm. in punk. And the most punk thing I do, I drive to work in. My old building, we got a new building that's fancy, but our old building, my friends would always say, I can hear you coming up like three blocks away. I blast my music like super loud. And to me, I just, I lose myself in music. And I think there's music people and there's non-music people. And if you're a music person, it just, it touches something inside of you that is inexplicable. I mean, I just lose myself. And I only think in song lyrics. Like, I literally, my boss will be like, what's that case site? I'm like, I don't know. Do you want to hear a Smith's lyric? I can tell you that. Like, it's like my head is full of lyrics, and I think in lyrics, and I think that's kind of fun, you know? I love the bus. Oh, I hate buses. <laughs> I get nervous. So they need to write all the case law and put it to music so you can listen to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can quote it. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? Yeah? Sure. <laughs> we just met. <laughs> Thanks for coming to my place. Uh, the second draft uh, brick wall that you hit, how do you get past that? Because that's what I'm on. It's, I wrote the book, I'm done, and then it's like, and now i got to reread what I wrote and write again and again and again. So, and I have ADHD, so it's <laughs> Good question. You know, if you if you have an opportunity to do so, put it aside for a while, and and either start writing something entirely different, or you know, do something else that you're really excited about, and then come back to it. Because there were moments when I just was tired of this, and I felt like I like I was just kind of trapped in my own words, and I put it on hold for a while, um, and. And then came back to it um, with this chat with this book. You know, it, it sometimes would happen with a particular chapter when I felt like I didn't know what I was saying, um, and so I kind of shelved it for a bit, and then came back to it. And so, with a fresh pair of eyes, it just it, it, it read differently the next time I encountered it. So, if you have that opportunity to take to distance yourself from it for a bit, you know, do that, and then come back to it because 
I think sometimes when you're so caught up in it, it's hard for you to kind of see outside of it. Yeah, you know, um, I wrote Tales, which is uh, much longer than the chapbook, which was kind of, I already had a lot of the essays from the chapbook that I had published in magazines, and then I just added some memoir pieces that I had already written and some poetry that I wrote in a workshop. I would say take a workshop, take a week for yourself, go to one of these workshops where you can get away for a week and really focus on you and your writing. I don't think this book would exist without Mona Macondo and doing it every summer for like seven years. Um, but I would say, you know, get a group of writers that will look at your work. Um, I wrote with uh, two writers, Francis Barella, who lives in Riverside, who's a professor at Mount Sac, and uh, Linda Hogan, who was a professor at Mount Sac, and we're both a little mature. We, we were all writing memoir, and we just get together once a month, drink wine, eat pizza, read each other's work, give some feedback, that helped. And then I had Liz Gonzalez do a beta read of it. Um, I had a friend just go through the whole book and um, let, just, you know, where's the repetition? Because I wrote every story in this book standalone. So then I had to synthesize them and take out all the repetition, which took almost two years, believe it or not, to try to synthesize standalone stories to a memoir. So I would say, if, you know, if you feel like it's good, like either put it aside or maybe just power through. You know, I had to do these stupid footnotes for this book and I threw out my neck and your back killed me. And uh, it's a lot of case sites and stuff like that and uh, song lyric sites. And I just powered through. I would drink espresso and I'd work every morning before work from four in the morning till seven in the morning for like six months because we were virtual. So I would do my visits with my clients at seven start working at nine, I'd end at five, I'd go to bed at seven, and I'd wake up at four. I think if you can get your rhythm to where you find your groove, where I only can write in the morning, right? I mean, some people write late at night. I think if you figure out where your muse is and where you can really just get into a groove and it becomes like a habit, then that's the way to go. But I like the idea of putting it aside, starting another project, and then coming back to it maybe a month or two, six months later. I think that's excellent advice from both of you. And that I want to ask a follow-up question with uh, Ricky. Did you use beta readers or did you have a work writing group that you or a writing buddy or somebody you shared with and got feedback from? Yeah, so um, I, I had a, a writing schedule. I like what Juanita's saying, you know, I would write every Monday through Friday with a friend who was finishing his dissertation. And if we had the time, we would write from nine to noon. Uh, and I was able to pull that off because my classes were in the evening and, and sometimes we couldn't make it or sometimes we could only do 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, but I think having that commitment uh, and being accountable to someone else is really useful. And, and then I was also part of a writing group, which I think is another excellent piece of advice too. So if you feel like you know the draft that you have now it's difficult to move beyond. I would say, you know, share it with someone that you trust or someone who you know can kind of give you feedback uh, because that was really useful for me, you know, having two colleagues, one who's an anthropologist and the other one who is a creative writer, you know, it, it, it just made a world of difference for them to see, you know, what I was trying to do um, in a field that was outside of my own. Yeah, I think that's, that's excellent advice, Get, getting a fresh pair of eyes. So that's how you break through that wall. Give it to somebody else, get some feedback. Jerry? Let me piggyback real quick, because this worked for me. Start on the last page and read it backwards out loud. Yeah. Backwards word by word? Or senses. Yeah. Oh, senses. Okay. Which is where we are. Start that. This is the last page, read it backwards. It takes it right out of your head and take everything out of context. You'll see all the reputations that come out, you'll see all your promise places. It's just really good. That's why my students do it all the time for children. Okay. I, that's something I've never tried. I think that's, uh, that's an excellent, another excellent tip. So, um, do we have any, any? I do have yeah. Okay. Um, I think a lot about class and how, because um, I was a bus driver, but a poor language kid who kept getting laid off, and we lived in tents for like 18 months, but we always knew the clash, you know, or, or um, you know, I think that Katie and things like that. But what I want to know is like, so both of you, public defender and a professor at university, how do you see yourselves in connection with anarchy and bringing down the system 
to be within the system and help get support. Good I mean, make it work. What is more punk rock than in the middle of COVID standing up to a judge and saying, let my people go? Nothing more punk rock. And what I realized during COVID is that I was desensitized and I had bought into the carceral system. I don't call it the criminal justice system. I call it the criminal system. It's meant to incarcerate people. Incarceration, there's a, I'm going to say this to Riverside judges. There's this California Supreme Court case that says incarceration should be the last resort, not the first resort. And Riverside judges are not enforcing that case law. And it's the California Supreme Court. So what is wrong in Riverside? A conservative city that is mostly brown. And when you go into a public, come into my courtroom, Department 42, RMH, and Mental Health Court, and see what color the people are. They're all black and brown. And I have a story in here where I tell my clients that they're going to be okay. And I'm lying to them. I am literally lying to them that they're going to be okay. Because this system is not designed to help people. It's not designed to help people and make them better. It's designed to harm people. And, it's just, and during COVID, my clients stayed incarcerated at the county jail, warehoused for 23.75 hours a day, sometimes 24 hours a day in a cell. And I had clients dying there. And no one cared. No one cared that my clients were dying. So for me, I started writing these bail motions, and then I realized I'm desensitized. I bought into this system. I think I can fix it from the inside. F that. Anarchy, man. I am not a believer in the criminal carceral system anymore. I am an abolitionist. The system is based on slavery and racism, and unless you're gonna recognize that as a public defender, you cannot do your job well. If you realize that at the foundation of the criminal system, it's based on slavery, and Angela Davis talked about this 20, 30 years ago, and I just met her, my idol, and she's still saying it, and now people are listening, finally. Yeah, I think it, to answer your question, you know, I, I, at the start of every quarter, you know, I walk into the classroom and, you know, I have no qualms with telling students what is available to them on campus uh, as far as resources, knowing very, know, knowing full well that our, our students are food insecure, a lot of them are homeless, a lot of them are struggling to make ends meet, and that, you know, I see them as people. They're not just numbers, they're not just, you know, people who, you know, butts in a seat, as the university likes to say. And, you know, I think that recognition, it means a lot to them because they feel like they can open up to me or they can come to me, you know, when, when they're experiencing um, certain things. And so I take the work that I do very seriously as a professor, but I also see them as people, as people who have, you know, these these issues that they're struggling with, you know, and, and I feel like that in many ways you know, goes against the operations of the university, which is sometimes about, you know, thinking of how, how it's just kind of like a, a conveyor belt. You know, you get the students in, you graduate them, and the next group of students comes in, and it's like, I want them to be able to feel empowered and to have a sense of, of who they are and, and to claim those resources because they're paying for it. Even if they're, you know, getting scholarships, they're paying for it physically, um, and, you know, even, you know, with their own money, and. So all that to say, you know, I, I, I think you know, it, it's one of the things that I take very seriously as an educator. It's not just about what I can teach them uh, through books or through lectures, but it's about connecting with them and making sure that they get to the next stage, the next stage of life, uh, in, in which they're able to um, succeed and, and to you know, excel in the work that they do, and, and to see their goals come to fruition. Thank you, Jade. And Jade works with so we appreciate you. Well, so I think um, that's a great note for us to, to end on. I think what you're doing about is great work. You're trying to break the system from the inside, and that's important to have that vision and to be that person willing to stand up and do the right thing regardless. Um, so I want to say thank you to everybody who is here tonight. I um, remind you that we have books on the back table and authors who would love to sign them. Um, and I, I also want to say thank you again to the Riverside Public Library for hosting us and 
tell everybody this Sunday, please join us uh, at another local venue at UCR Arts, the Barbara and Art Culver Center of the Arts for our 10 year anniversary of the Inlandia Literary Journeys columns. So if any of you, I don't know if you take the paper or if you've seen these circulating online, but um, just really proud. I've been there since the very beginning and we're gonna have a lot of uh, readers, including Juanita, who will be back reading one of her columns. So uh, join us and until then, we will uh, we'll see you and thank you for being here.